Hello and welcome back to Rocket Pod, where we are on a mission to find some of the most amazing visionaries from across all different industries and professions, deconstructing their stories and sharing these insights with you, our listeners at home. And for today's show, we are bringing on the mic Daniel Priestley. Now, Daniel is an entrepreneur, best-selling author and international speaker. Starting with nothing, he built successful multi-million dollar businesses in Australia, UK and Singapore. I think we should get this going. Enjoy. Uh, we were just talking about uh, Rocket Pod um, um, and this deconstructing a vi- you know, visionaries mindset. How do we tap into that? And I think um, you're quite unusual in the sense that um, you know, you've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, some wannabes, some uh, you know, real entrepreneurs and, and helping them kind of take things to the next level. And um, I think one other thing that uh, really kind of interested me and kind of struck a chord with me when we met um, a number of years d- ago, Daniel, at Home House, and you were talking about how you know, every, all the, you know, every business starts with a conversation um, and that you didn't need to necessarily own this beautiful building. Um, you could experience it. Uh, and I think we can all agree, you know, we're, as the economy grows and we're, we have access to digital resources, you know, th- this experience piece is, is really key. Um, but, you, but, but also assets are quite, they're often invisible. And I know you talk about that in, in your 24 Assets book. So I think um, to kick it off, uh, why don't we just dive right in? Um, can you tell us a bit about what, what you do or how you, yeah, who is Daniel Priestley for those uh, listeners out there that don't know who you are? Um, and is there any kind of life philosophies that you, you live by uh, every day? Uh, yeah, so Daniel Priestley, I'm father of three kids, live in London. I originally um, was born in Australia. Uh, I started my first company when I was 21 years old and it became a fast growth company in Australia. Uh, where we grew from zero to a million in the first year and one to $10.7 million in year three and four. Um, And then I left Australia after exiting the business, came to the UK, set up another business. Um, 10 years ago, we launched the Dent Accelerator. Uh, We've now had three and a half thousand entrepreneurs that we've worked with to develop them to stand out, scale up, make a dent in the universe, positive impact. Um, We have offices in London, in Sydney and in Toronto. Um, and we have a group of companies that offer services like publishing, film production, IT services, marketing services. Um, so I guess you could say I'm very entrepreneurial. I, I lead a group of entrepreneurs, three and a half thousand entrepreneurs around the world. I'm, I'm sort of head up the, the group that, uh, that, that we're accelerating them. Um, and then along the way, I've been documenting my journey in, uh, in a series of books. So I've written uh, four best-selling books uh, and co-authored three other books. Um, about entrepreneurship. Daniel, amazing. Thank you, Harry. Um, it's great to meet you and thank you for, for joining us. That sounds that's a brilliant snippet um, of everything you've been going on. I think, um, yeah, I think you're an amazing inspiration. Um, so I guess for me, I'm always interested to understand. So I'm at a very early stage in my business journey. So could you take us back a little bit to maybe the first few stages when you first started that business at 21? What made you take make that decision to start? And obviously, what did it require to go from to a million in the first year? So from age 19 to 21, I worked for a gentleman called John. Uh, I was employee number three in his company and we grew very rapidly to 60 employees over, over a couple of years. Um, and I did, I did uh, two years working with John and I actually got the experience of seeing what it's like to start a business and grow from zero to uh, 60 employees and and uh, six or seven million dollars worth of revenue um, and because I was there as employee number three um, I had this great relationship with John right. and one day I went to him and I said um, I said John can I please get shares in the business I, I was here at the very start and now it's really taking off I want to get shares in the business and John said if you want shares in a business you should go start your own business so I caught him <laughs> at the wrong time and, uh, and he wasn't very particularly warm to the idea of giving me shares in the business. Um, and, uh, and he joked and said, go start your own. And I just took him seriously and I went and did. <laughs> so uh, so I, I guess I did an apprenticeship for two years and my apprenticeship was being in the, dry, in the passenger seat for, uh, for a very fast growth company, startup. Um, and then I just copied it. I replicated mm-hmm. it. I did all the things that we did. I, you know, I, I ran the same sort of meetings and I, um, 
run the same sort of advertising campaigns and created the same sort of brochures and materials. And uh, I just kind of, I, I already just knew all the suppliers that we needed to have in place. Yeah. Um, I started with a team of about three of us uh, and then um, kind of rapidly grew, uh, grew from there. Interesting. And your choice to go do an apprenticeship, that's a choice that I made and decided to do that. Did you find that was the right choice for you instead of, because obviously there's the conversation at the moment where you, is it university, is it an apprenticeship? I decided to do the apprenticeship route like you. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, the school system and the university system are very, very slow systems to, to change. The courses that get written, um, they don't change those very often. So essentially in a fast changing world, I always assume that the schooling system and the university system is going to give you some guiding principles or it's going to give you some good foundational knowledge and certainly historical context. But I wanted to do fast growth entrepreneurship. So uh, I needed to be around fast growth entrepreneurs. I needed to see it actually happening. Uh, now, entrepreneurship is an incredibly complex topic and it's a little bit like being given a thousand pieces of Lego and saying, you know, this is, you know, this is everything you need in order to to put together an amazing, you know, Millennium Falcon uh, Lego set. But if you've if you've not got, <laughs> yeah, if you've not got the instruction manual, if you've not got someone with you who knows how to put that together, you're looking at all these pieces in total overwhelm. Going, I, I have no idea where to start. So the world at the moment is like that thousand piece Lego set. There is just everything you need is just there. So there's never been a better time to have, you know, to access capital. There's never been a better time for finding talented team members. There's never been a better time for launching into big global markets. Like this is the greatest time in history to be an entrepreneur. But ultimately, if you are, if you're sitting there without an instruction set as to how to put all that together, um, it's stressful. That's really interesting. So um, you might have seen from the the the, the prep sheet we sent over last night. Uh, my fifteen year old daughter Pip was uh, one of her questions was you know w you know why why do we go to school um, and you know I guess there, what was the like, what was the second bit of the question Peter is you uh... that's right uh, yeah Pip asked uh, what is the point of school and how did school help you so well kind of two conflicting questions but uh, useful well look the school school's not entirely pointless um, you know football players go to the gym on the off season and the pre-season and they lift heavy weights and they do rowing activities and they uh, do chin-ups and pull-ups uh, and they might even you know do back activities and arms biceps curls and tricep curls and you say what does a footballer need to you know be doing bicep curls and tricep curls for there's no bicep curls in in a game of football and it's like well actually it's just part of just becoming a more strong well-rounded person um, so to a degree, the schooling system is there to, to try and help people become, you know, to, to gain certain strengths, and to have a, a structured environment to explore and to learn and to learn the skills of learning and to learn social skills and, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. But with that said, and, and I'm not anti-school and I'm not anti-teachers, I, I think, you know, teachers should be paid much better and school should be valued more highly. But with that said, the schooling system was built uh, for a time where people were born, went to school and got a job all within about a 10 to 20 mile radius of each other. And there's a good chance that wherever you end up working for your entire career was probably 10 miles from where you went to school and was probably 10 miles from where you were born. Um, so that was for hundreds of years, that was the case. And it's only extremely rarely, uh, extremely recently, sorry, that that's different so you know it's only you know harry how old are you so you know you're you're born late 1990 you were born late 90s so you know for all of your life computers internet pr printers all of those things are just like the most normal thing to have around the house it's like having a couch or a chair or <laughs> something like that you know, it's and fast internet has always been a thing for you. You've never, you don't remember slow internet, and you don't remember, um, you know, you don't remember a time where it was impossible to get a video download or something like that, or an image download, or even to get a download, right? So, 
So all of that, all of that's incredibly recent. So it might seem to someone your age, Harry, that the schooling system is woefully unprepared, but it's, you know, for, for a massive global institution, it's only recently been a thing where you can live and work from anywhere, where you could form a global company with 10 of your friends and sell to, you know, 30,000 followers in a Facebook group and create an online community and charge for, for products and create your own software and develop, you know, develop your own media company. Like the idea that a young person could have media, software, community, um, intellectual property, a global audience, all of that sort of stuff is so recent, like incredibly recent. It's like 10, 15 years old. So the schooling system's, you know, a multi-hundred year old, old institution. It's going to have to take a little while to adapt and change to this. You can't change the schooling system every time there's a new fad. But the truth is, is this isn't a new fad. This is genuinely a completely different way of living and working, which is here to stay. So I think the schooling system will change. Uh, I don't think you know, it'll be recognisable in maybe 10 years or 20 years. Um, things will change. Um, and, uh, you know, why do you go to school? To, to make friends, to lift some heavy weights, to build some strengths. And, and if you're expecting school to be the be-all and end-all and completely prepare for you, prepare you, then that's the wrong mindset. School is there as, at the moment, School is there to make sure you don't drop below the 20th percentile. It's like it's, it's there to prevent you from dropping into poverty or for, to dropping into uh, a life where you've got no skills and no prospects and no friends, nothing. It's not there to get you into the top 20%. It's there to prevent you from falling into the bottom 20%. Yeah, that's really, I like the way that the, the instruction manual um, analogy you use with the Lego set. Um, and it's almost like school, um, it, it shows people that you can focus on something for a period of time and get to a certain level um and obviously that's one measurement and then you know the apprenticeship you did daniel you know you you kind of learned a, you know a part of the instruction manual and then you obviously made decided to take the leap so it's almost like these different areas of your life that you get different pages of the instruction manual at some point you're gonna have to jump off if entrepreneurship is for you um you're gonna have to jump off but um that's a good way to you know um to think about it here's the other here's the other thing to keep in mind Let's imagine that school did teach you how to live well in the times that we're in and every single person got taught how to build communities, how to monetize communities, how to start and scale businesses, um, how to pitch big ideas, how to raise funding for investment. Oh man, would it be hard to get ahead? <laughs> like it would be so hard. You would be, you would be in competition with millions of students with great ideas and the, and the know how to make it work. The schooling system's brilliant because it's broken, uh, because basically it's, it's just simply trying to get people to be around average, right? It's trying to maintain some average, which is great because 95% of all the people are going to be happy with average. And if you're one of the 5% of people who actually wants to do something with your life, um, you know, then you're not competing against 95% of people. They're, they're just, they're just getting the basic skills and you're, you know, you, you just, grab the bull by the horns and, and race ahead. It, it won't be a great thing when the, school, when the schooling system starts teaching best practices for entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, watch out because <laughs> you're going to be in competition with them all. Um, so what's on your mind this week, Daniel? Is there anything that you've learned or anything that, that's inspired you or even in the last month or last, last few months, uh, anything you would like to talk about or share with our listeners? Um, any 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 gold nuggets that you can think of? Uh, well, a couple of things. Number one, I've spent the last six weeks uh, learning about Clubhouse and um, and jumping on this new social network called Clubhouse, which is essentially social media meets radio, talkback radio, um, and it's been pretty explosive. So in the last six weeks, I've had thirty seven thousand people follow me, and we've built some you know big audiences. And you know, we every time we go live, we get two three thousand people listening. And um, it's been pretty amazing that you, you know, you kind of thought that social media was finished and that it was all everything that could be invented had been invented. And then along comes Clubhouse and suddenly it's got explosive growth like Facebook did 10 years ago. So that's been fun and exciting. I really enjoyed having global conversations and being in virtual rooms with people who, uh, who are, you know, people I would love to be in any room with and just having the opportunity to be in that room. Um, one thing that is on my mind more than ever 
is that the world through digital media is is um, is becoming a very flat place where uh, cross cross global communication is happening effortlessly and global networking is happening effortlessly and i'm i'm seeing i'm seeing a dangerous situa- situation unfolding and the dangerous situation is that in the 1970s factory workers miners blue collar workers in the uk and usa and australia were put into direct competition with china and basically you know there used to be all these people who worked in blue collar jobs in in the uk and then uh, they had to compete with people who were happy to work for one tenth the price and who were actually just as good. And what happened is over the course of about 10 years, all the manufacturing moved over to China and China became the manufacturer of the world. And there were really no blue collar jobs left uh, in most parts of England. And that you go around England and there's a lot of communities that have never recovered as a result of, um, you know, the loss of manufacturing um, from the seventies and eighties. Um, what's happening at the moment is 10 years ago, 30% of the world's population had, um, fast internet and they basically, uh, were all first world countries. And today 30%, uh, an extra 30%. So 60% of the world's population have got fast internet, but it's all developed countries. Uh, developing countries, sorry, right? So what's actually happening and what I'm seeing more and more is that if you are essentially working on a screen, if you're uh, on a laptop, on an internet connection, and that's your job, you are now in competition with people who are happy to work for one fifth of what you're happy to work for. Um, And, you know, there are accounting firms in India that are dedicated to UK accounting. There are legal firms in Pakistan that are dedicated to providing legal services only in the UK. Um, You know, this stuff is happening super fast. There are video production companies in the Ukraine and and coders and developers and all of this sort of stuff popping up in developing countries. And, um, you know, there's fashion design houses that are um, incredible fashion designers in Turkey. And, uh, And these people are all people who are quite happy with about $100 a day. And, um, and, you know, they're competing with people who are happy for four or $500 a day. Uh, so there's, there's kind of like this dangerous situation unfolding. At the same time, there's a small group of people uh, who are able to build communities and who are building these very fast growing communities, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people, uh, where they're using the, the digital technology to build community. And they're almost creating their own markets where they can sell stuff pretty easily and effortlessly to 40 or 50,000 people who are in their community and people who previously should have only been earning a couple of hundred, $500 a day at most are now earning $5,000 a day. So, you know, I'm seeing personal trainers, fitness trainers who focus on community building on Instagram. They end up with a hundred thousand Instagram followers and then they end up making hundreds of thousands of dollars serving their community. So it will go out running uh, one, you know, they're, they're both neck and neck. They're pretty much one's a little faster, one's a little behind. And then one of them adopts a different strategy, uh, which is um, getting on a bicycle. And then the other one starts getting a bit tired and starts competing with people who are fresh. And the person who's riding the bicycle starts powering ahead. And then the person who was running next to them starts slipping behind. And then along come these fresh off the bench runners who are super excited you know, to have the opportunity to run for the first time. And this, the, there's a reorganizing of the world going on, but I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the, the standard distribution of income and benefits and rewards in society is being very much upset, disrupted and, and redistributed. I'd like to take this moment to introduce to you our sponsor, Flexi, the must-have app to track and manage your subscriptions in one place. So most of us have multiple subscriptions nowadays for things like streaming services, gym memberships and food deliveries. These are great and take the hassle out of buying everyday products that we consume regularly, but it can be hard to keep track of them. That's where Flexi comes in handy, using super secure technology to connect your accounts to see all your subscriptions in a single dashboard, putting you in control of your spending. 
And what's more, Flexi's subscription marketplace allows you to discover new products you may love, all easy to pause, resume, or cancel in a swipe or two. So give Flexi a try, it's free to download from the App Store, or check out their website at www.flexiapp.uk. That's F L E X Y app.uk. Back to the podcast. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, on that, so this is a slightly off tangent topic. Um, but as far as um, do you have any conviction as an entrepreneur, as far as you know, you know, ESG, or do you feel responsibility to make the world a better place from your success as far as the distribution of wealth? Do you have any ideas around that uh, in particular, as far as I guess ethical entrepreneurship, or do you think we have a responsibility as entrepreneurs to? You know, I know, you know, make the world a better place. I know there's, you know, <laughs> the big world out there. Yeah, I think um, I think it's uh, not only a responsibility, it's a lot of fun to make the world a better place. It's very rewarding to do something like that. So rather than it being a burden, it should actually be seen as an opportunity. I think um, the greatest, op- you know, pr- problems are opportunities for entrepreneurs. The difference between an entrepreneur and most people is that an entrepreneur sees problems and goes, oh, I bet there's money in solving that. I bet there's some great way we could solve that. So an entrepreneur walks down the street, sees all the dirty cars and thinks, oh, maybe I could wash those cars and get paid to do so. Um, you know, so they're seeing something that's wrong and thinking about the opportunity of what it, what it could mean um, and, and extrapolate that to the top level. Uh, and great entrepreneurs are saying, okay, there's plastic in the oceans. There must be an opportunity in, in figuring out how to remove it. Um, or there's some um, inequality. There must be an opportunity to figure that out. Uh, or the school system's broken. There must be an opportunity in that. So essentially, it's, it's the funnest businesses are the ones that you're changing the world. Because if you're changing the world, you're attracting talented people around you. And if you're attracting talented people around you, uh, you're having a great time because you're spending your time with fun and talented people. Uh, talented people won't come and work for a company that's boring or dull or that has a small mission or that's only mission is to make money. Like skillful, talented, amazing people are going to come and work in companies that are up to something big. So, um, so I wouldn't say it's a responsibility. I just simply say for, for very selfish reasons, you should, uh, you, you should, uh, be changing the world for the better because it's a lot more fun to be doing that absolutely and a lot of i've noticed that some companies will do that will pick particular goals to benefit themselves so they'll do that to make themselves look better but i think it's the companies that do that as part of their why they're why they exist i think is a much better route to take and i think that's a really great way of of putting that yeah big Um, companies are big 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 companies are quite funny they're like oh we need CSR, corporate social responsibility. And it's like, let's hire a CSR person. Um, and, you know, small companies, are, small entrepreneurial companies are very much like, no, no, our DNA is solving problems, meaningful problems. You know, what, what, we're, what we exist to do is to solve meaningful problems. And if we solve it and we get put out of business as a result of solving it, we'll go solve another meaningful problem. Um, you know, that's the difference between working for a small entrepreneurial company as opposed to a massive boring corporate i had a question actually i wanted to touch on it's about in- instant gratification um and it goes back to what you were saying earlier about entrepreneurship and about sort of the different pieces of lego now a lot of people i've noticed nowadays want that want that instant gratification they see on social media they see uh foreign exchange traders loads of money straight away what they don't want to put the effort in they want to just see the instant results what is your thoughts on that subject uh, well, the human brain is built um, in three stages. There's there's the reptile, which wants to avoid danger, wants to avoid peril, um, and it it's going to look for anything dangerous and and try and fight, flight, or freeze on it. Um, and then there's the autopilot, which wants to get into positive feedback loops, where it where it pushes the button and the sugar comes out, and it pushes the button and the sugar comes out, and put you know push the button sweets, push the button sweets, right? And and it goes back it goes back to if I go to this fishing spot, then I always catch fish. So I will go back to the fishing spot. So there's this part of the brain that's very much geared for those positive feedback loops where it's it becomes habit forming because that's a survival strategy. Anything that anything anything that um 
anything that we do or a lot of people do is obviously goes back to a survival strategy. Um, so instant gratification is like, it's like, oh, there's an opportunity to, you know, get bananas, better get those bananas. Let's go get them. Um, or, or, you know, it's kind of like that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then there's this third part of the brain, which is called the visionary. And this is all about strategy, long-term survival, long-term thinking, um, you know, putting together teams, uh, having vision, having um, delayed gratification, understanding that even though those bananas are there right now, if we don't tend to the whole, you know, forest, then we probably run out of bananas within a few days. So we better do both. Um, so all of that uh, is is how the brain is built. And we want all three of those. We don't want to have peril. If there's a bear, we want to run away. Um, if there's bananas, we want to pick the bananas and eat them. And if we want to survive long-term, we better have a long-term vision. So entrepreneurs tend to be very active in the visionary part of the brain. They're very much, they're thinking about three-year vision, five-year vision. They're thinking about what could they create. Um, and when you're in the visionary part of the brain, you actually increase your IQ by about 15 points, which is a whole standard deviation. You're, you're, you're a standard deviation smarter while you're visionary. And if you, compared to the autopilot, and if you're in reptile mode, you're a standard deviation dumber you're actually 15 points of iq you drop in iq so when you're angry when you're enraged you actually are really stupid you say stupid things you you muddle up your words your vocabulary drops you you know you're very much in the moment saying and doing dumb things um so so the the entrepreneur who is thinking three years out and thinking about creating something of value inherently has more intelligence so they look at the forex trader and they go that's just a lie like i can understand that that's not real that's not true uh, the monkey brain is like oh wow he's sitting on a lamborghini if he's sitting on a lamborghini then that must be true because how else could he be sitting on a lamborghini if he wasn't doing exactly what he said and what would the, the i can't see any ulterior motives there so i better go and try and pick those bananas um so it basically some very, very, very smart marketers understand how to just hack into it's a, it's a hack to hack into the young male brain, especially young men, young men in particular are, are particularly easy to radicalize and uh, they're pumping with testosterone chemicals. So it's very easy when you've got really high surging testosterone, it's very easy to fool someone who's like that and, and, Young men want to be radicalized. They want, they want to join a gang. They want to join something. They want to be up to something. They want to prove themselves to the tribe. It's biological. You know, around the age of 15 to 25 is when a young man proves himself to the tribe and attracts a mate as a result of doing so. So we don't have a lot of that in society anymore. We don't have places where that's healthy. It used to be you could join the military. You could go down a mine. You could join a fishing boat you would come back with fish and everyone would go, wow, that's amazing. Now it's not considered a Instagram worthy profession. You know, you go down a mine and you would literally be providing the energy and the heating and the electricity for your town and people respected you for that. And now no one respects that. Um, you know, or you would, um, you'd join the military and people would actually buy you your beer and your cu cups of coffee because they knew you were serving in the military. And now people give you their political beliefs about that. So, and there's not many military jobs anymore. So young men in particular are built for hierarchies. We want hierarchies to climb at a certain age. We want to start at the bottom and prove that we can get close to the top. So what's left in society, computer games, really, you know, really great, uh, computer games are perfect for young men because they're hierarchical. You know, you start at the bottom and you, you have no points and then you get points and you build up armor and shields and weapons and, and then status. And then people know who you are and you walk into a particular game room and, and everyone goes, Oh shit, you know, Harry's here and he's got the bazookas and it's like, you know, so, so it's perfect. and some young men don't get into computer games so they get into looking around instagram and they think okay how do you get the cars and the girls how do you get the status points and they go okay everyone talks about this stupid thing called fx forex trading which is just by the way just you can edit this out if you want but there is no such just for anyone listening there is no such thing as forex trading 
to get ahead. That doesn't exist. It's not a thing. Um, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this. Imagine if James came to me and said, Daniel, do you know how much NBA basketballers make? NBA basketballers make a fortune. Daniel, you should go and be an NBA basketball player. Look at, look at how much money. And it's like, if I go into the NBA and play one-on-one with an NBA basketball player, I could play for four hours, six hours, eight hours. I, the only chance I would ever have of scoring, the other guy got bored and went off to go to the toilet or something and I could shoot three or four points while he was going to the toilet and then he comes back and then that would be it, right? So the score at the end of the day is going to be 800 nil. Uh, you know, like it's just, it's just, you know, a zero sum game like Forex is so dumb that you could be a, the, the idea that a 23 year old could go up against a PhD from Stanford university armed with all the tools, all the instruments and, and all the data and all the algorithms and everything. And the idea that you could go in and, and make any money whatsoever in that environment is You've lost before you even start, basically. It's actually interesting. On this instant gratification thing, I have three teenage daughters, uh, 13, 15, and 17. And, um, you know, there's so much of this eye candy and this instant gratification and a lot of the, you know, on the phones. And it's very, very, it's challenging to manage sometimes because you know that there's, you know, folks in the background trying to make these things addictive and, you know, everyone's seen the social dilemma on TV. And, but but on the other side, it is a scientific fact that children today are actually have a higher IQ than, you know, our generation because they just have all this information coming at them. So it's like, it, there's, it seems to be for every, for every great thing, there's always the dark side. So for every, for whether it's light, there's dark. There is, there is. And we have to, the issue with young girls is, is that girls, you know, whereas men fight physically, women fight socially and social media weaponizes the way women bully and you know female suicides has tripled in the last 10 15 years and all of this sort of stuff like and and um you know women naturally compare each, compare themselves to each other and my grandmother's generation she had probably 75 girls to compare herself with in her entire reality so there was there was the girls in the there were the girls in the grade below there were the girls in the grade above and there were the girls in her grade and, and basically, the way it worked for my nana is, well, there's Mary, and she's prettier than I am, but I'm a better cook and a better dancer than she is. And there's Sally, and she's a better dancer than I am, but I've got, you know, nicer hair and legs, all right? And it's like, you know, this little comparing, niggling thing that's going on between these teenage girls. But now, you literally go, go and find the prettiest girl out of a billion who is also born into a massively wealthy family, has a personal trainer, uh, can Photoshop her images, has a massive house and a holiday home and a ski lodge, has, a, has access to cars and private jets and all this sort of stuff. You just find that girl and just go, boom, there you go. Look at that all the time. And basically what it does is it just crushes you and go, there's absolutely no frontier that I can beat you on. Um, and the human brain just shuts down and says, I can't even play that game. Like there's no, there's no way of winning. Um, so, you know, social media has a very dark side because it hacks, especially, especially for age 15 to 25 boys and girls for different reasons. Absolutely. We had um, Jack Edwards, who's uh, a YouTube influencer on series one. And he was saying that, I mean, I think he's got nearly 300,000 subscribers now who are, 300,000 mainly people that he probably has, has never met that follow his journey and has followed his journey and it's a really interesting story but he was saying that yeah people will comment he never met them before and he's had some really sort of harsh comments about about himself stuff that he wouldn't have even thought that was a bad thing they've gone and pointed that out they've taken the time to point out that he's that something's up he's, and he, he's he read, and exactly he exactly and he's read that and he's, he said it he said he he reads every comment and he's feeling that he may be on his own reading all these comments from these people he's never met and that impact on his sort of mental health and stuff is huge and like you say there's that hundreds of thousands millions of billions of people that you're comparing yourself to now and another perspective as well another thing that i so i, I got obviously occasionally i get let into their work you know my daughter's worlds as far as their social media 
usage. Um, and what dawned on me is that, you know, when we were at school, if you were having a bad teenage moment or you were having, you know, you had some dark thoughts, whatever, then you would, you'd basically figure it out at home with your parents. And then you'd go back to school and you'd be bright and shot, you know, you know, but you'll be, you'll be fine again. Now, everything is literally in the moment. Um, so if you're feeling like suicidal thoughts, um, you basically reach out to your friends and it's just bombarded, you know, um, it's just so much information overload to all these emotional and, you know, teenagers that their emotions are 10 times. There's also, you know, just how do you handle it? There's also the fact that when I was in, when I was in high school, you know, getting, getting absolutely wasted drunk uh, was embarrassing in front of 10 people. And unless you were there, you missed it. Thank goodness. And you might've heard about it, but you didn't actually see me throwing up. Um, whereas now, if you're throwing up, there's 10 cameras on you and that's being broadcast out to the whole school. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a totally different world. And you, you know, you don't, I mean, you, yeah, you, you don't, you're not, no one's equipped to deal with it. You just have to figure it out. But it's a, it's a really, it's an amazing world we live in. Like you said, Daniel, um, earlier, as far as, you know, all these opportunities available to us, you know, you can, you know, start up a business, get a 30,000 following, you know, sell to a global market, literally from your bedroom. Um, and, uh, you know, that's incredible. But uh, on the other side, it's just, you know, how do you manage it? You just have to... Yeah, we're at a, we're at a cusp in history where the way that we know uh, or the way that things have been for the last best part of 100 years are, um, are just changing. The way we live and work is changing. So, Daniel, just a, a question as well. So you, you run multiple businesses. You mentioned a film business. You've got a, you know, an e-commerce technology business. You've got a training program for entrepreneurs and a book publishing business and probably other businesses that you're working on. Um, how do you manage these different businesses? You know, do, do you believe in a work-life balance? Do you have any comments about, um, you know, is, it, is that just a, is that, um, a utopia? Is it, is it, does it exist? How do you manage your time? Any, any tips out there or any, any insight that you can give to, um, you know, to life as an entrepreneur? Nor traditional employees working in larger companies, they have, uh, a lot more, uh, less deviation between the days or months of the year. So it's a lot easier to find a work-life balance when work always kind of starts at nine and finishes at 5.30 and it, it always is Monday to Friday and there's always six weeks of holidays you can take. So you can form the basis of um, normality a lot easier from that. And especially if you're working on a team where there's 15,000 people who work in your company, you know, there's always enough resource and there's always, there's kind of, it's a, it's a moving, evolving organism and, you know, there's built in safety nets, but there's also built in ceilings and, you know, you kind of just move at that kind of speed and you get, you know, how much money you're going to earn at the end of the year, you know how to budget it, right? So all of that sort of stuff is built into that kind of a system. Um, the difference with entrepreneurship is you go through seasons and, um, and this is where it's very difficult and not, not many people are prepared for the season. So um, there is a season in entrepreneurship that is extremely hard work. So the reason, let me, let me kind of gather my thoughts. The reason a business becomes extremely successful is because it has a team of people working with proprietary assets that are unique to that business and they're sweating those assets together as a team and creating a level of performance. So you've got a team, you've got assets and you've got performance, right? And in the early stages of business, you're trying to recruit a team without any brand or without any culture or without any you know, momentum. Um, so you're basically hiring all of the wrong people by default. You have to, right? In the early days, the first five people you're going to hire are going to be you know, people like Harry, right? They're going to be hardly any experience they might have passion they might have enthusiasm but they don't have 15 years worth of experience and connections and all of that sort of stuff you're going to rope together some young friends of friends and get them on a team together um, and then you're going to have to train them and and work with them and and kind of you know develop them so the first phase is not only are you trying to juggle the business into some form of existence and performance you're hiring people who are inexperienced who are wrong for the role and then you're also trying to pull together some assets like systems, culture, brand, uh, intellectual property, media assets, software assets, tech stack. So you're pulling all these tools and assets together 
while also hiring people who are inexperienced while also trying to serve customers and make sure that you make sales and, and look after people. So that season, that particular season, which might last six months or it might last several years, is an extremely difficult season because you're effectively doing 20 hours of each thing. So there's 60 hours every week. There's no getting around it. Um, you can try and bring that down, but then the season will just last longer. So you can bring it down to I'm going to do 15 hours of training and recruitment, 15 hours of asset development and 15 hours of selling and marketing and performing. So now I'll, I'll maintain a 45 hour week, but now, now my business is shit for three years, not, not one year. Or you can say, I'm going to chew glass and get through this, do 60 hour weeks, 20 hours of recruiting and training, 20 hours of asset development, 20 hours of selling, marketing, delivering. And it's like, okay, now, now we get through this in 12 months. So you, there's really no getting around it. You either eat glass and have a, have a uh, difficult 12 months or you have work-life balance and have a shit business for three years. So choose your poison. Um, the, uh, the, the, but here's the, here's the flip side. The flip side is there's another season in entrepreneurship where you've got an amazing team, you've got really productive assets and the team are sweating those assets and making profit and and, and the business is working and there's not a lot for you to do as the business owner. I've had, I've had prolonged stretches where I'm earning incredible money and I'm not doing very much. Um, so, so I think with entrepreneurship, you have to almost accept the fact that it's going to move in these seasons. You're going to have a season of working your ass off and then you're going to have a season of much more being in a business owner um, and just having a team of people who do it. The only difference is, is that most people don't really know what they're working towards. So most people just think that, oh, I'm just going to work really hard. And all they do is do sales, marketing and client delivery, but they're not developing a team and they're not building assets. So therefore, there's no end in sight. They're just working hard. Um, they, might, they might accrue some money in the, in the bank, but eventually they burn out because they're not transitioning into the opposite season. But different careers have different seasons if you're a professional musician for example there's going to be a season where you're in studio and you're just writing and you're creating an album and you're not moving around very much and you're actually just kind of like in this creative space and not interacting with a lot of people and then you'll have a season where you're touring and you're out on the road a lot and you're in a different city every night and you're seeing thousands and thousands of new people ever all the time and they're different you know, that's, that's what it means to be a musician. You're going to have a different life compared to someone who works at KPMG. So you've just got to accept what is the rhythm of this particular profession. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's going to have a different rhythm to, to being a school teacher. Yeah, that's, I, I really like the way you described that because it's, um, it is, it's, it's tough. You know, it, there's times, I mean, you know, in the last, I'm just, in the last 12 months, um, I've had a lot of 3 a.m. pacing around the house at 3 a.m. thinking, holy crap, you know, how the hell am I going to, you know, <laughs> pay these these bills and, and raise the capital? And it's really, really difficult. But then you come out the other side and, and normally the money shows up just at the last minute, as it, as it always does. Um, but, um, but to know that, uh, you know, there is that light at the end of the tunnel and um, the seasons, the cycles that you talked about, um, and I think actually, it, it actually, it's a good segue on. So um, I've actually been asked uh, to talk about resilience at a, a, another podcast. And, you know, um, I think having the purpose, you mentioned the, the, the entrepreneur, the visionary, the longer term thinking, you know, to have, have that purpose, that mission, um, it almost makes, I mean, it, it, can, you talk, can you comment about resilience? Um, and do you think the purpose is, a, is, is to do with it um, as far as, you know, overcoming some of these big mountains or moving these big mountains, uh, you know, what it takes to actually build a business. It, it, it's really difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, do you, can you comment about resilience and your, your relationship with it? Yeah. So um, one of the paradoxes of business is that it is a game of delayed gratification. And yet, the human brain needs short-term rewards in order for it to be energized. So it's very, very, very difficult for um, the human brain to consistently give you the happy drugs, the chemicals that make you feel good, if you're not getting little payoffs 
along the way. Um, and if you're not seeing your status improve. So we're very status aware creatures, especially men. Um, we're, we're very aware. We, we, we figure out where we fit in the hierarchy pretty quickly when we, when we uh, hang out in groups. Um, and unless you see your status improving or you see short-term rewards along the way, you get starved of dopamine and it makes you very miserable. And that's basically the, essentially that is the brain saying this isn't working. You've got limited time on this planet and I'm not getting any feedback that what you're doing is paying off. So therefore I'm going to make you feel miserable until you stop it. <laughs> so, so basically uh, you need, if you're going to have resilience, you're going to have to have increased status and little rewards along the way. You have to build that in. You have to build it in. So, um, you know, so you got to basically book out your holidays and make sure you take your holidays. Uh, you got to set yourself little rewards and say, if I hit this target, I'll buy myself that guitar. Um, uh, you know, you've got to celebrate your wins. So when you make that first sale, rather than saying delayed gratification, it's not a hundred sales. It's like, no, celebrate the, the first sale, celebrate the 10th sale, celebrate every damn round number that comes along, right? Here's a little, here's a little tip. Look for the round numbers and celebrate them all. So the hundredth sale uh, is definitely to celebrate. The tenth sale is definitely to celebrate. Um, you know the the ten out of ten score uh, from our customers. Uh, you know celebrate the little wins. Celebrate all the round numbers. Anything that looks like a little round number, celebrate it um, because that's going to move your brain. That's going to engage your brain in in the feeling of winning. Uh, and then ultimately. Stay status is uh is is you know win your awards win your industry awards when you you know put your put yourself out there get yourself on social media and and explain to the world what it is that you did well and let people give you the pat on the back that you did it well and acknowledge the fact and 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 say yeah it's great we're at, we're getting good feedback from the marketplace but don't cut yourself off from those feedback loops because the brain Brain's very clever. It's evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and it's just very simple. It's like if it doesn't think that what you're doing is working as far as making you more uh, appealing to a mate or able to access resources, uh, it's basically going to cut you off from it. It's going to make you feel miserable till you stop. Interesting. Peter, do you have a question for Daniel? I do. Yeah. Um, it's all right. We kind of skipped over the introductions a little bit at the beginning. So... So yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I do have a question, and also what you just said about the mind making you miserable when you're doing something you don't enjoy is I've felt that in the in the past few years. Uh, so I used to build websites, and now I build furniture. And those last three, three, even four years of building the websites, I was just miserable doing that. And even though I was making money, it just wasn't wasn't what I wanted to do. So now I've kind of found my passion. But um, Right. You mentioned Clubhouse a little bit in uh, at the beginning yeah. of the conversation, and I don't know if that platform is obviously uh, we're talking to entrepreneurs and kind of people that are interested in that. But maybe if there's someone that doesn't know what Clubhouse is, could you explain it a little bit more? And also, um, if you were to choose one platform to kind of share your content and story on, uh, what would it be and why? So. Um... Clubhouse is a, is a social media website. It's an app on the phone, uh, like Instagram is an app on your phone. But um, Clubhouse is uh, audio only, so you can only hear people's voices. You go into a digital room, um, and there are there are some people who can speak. They're called you know moderators or speakers. They're up on the digital stage, sharing ideas, talking. And then there's a digital audience of people who are listening to those ideas. So when you first log into the app, there's a list of all the potential rooms you could go and listen in on. So there might be a room, they're like radio stations, I guess, talkback radio stations. There might be a room called advice for you know people going out dating. Um, and you'll have some people on the stage talking about dating advice. And then you know there might be 50 people in the room listening to it. And there might be five or six people talking about dating. Um, and then you go into advice on how to grow a business and you'll have six or seven entrepreneurs talking up on stage and 60 or 70 people in the audience listening. And you can 
push a little button and raise your hand and get, get up on the stage, ask questions, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's what's interesting about it is that basically it's it's like sitting around a table having a conversation, but everyone's from all over the world. So regularly, I'm having chats with people where on the stage you've got someone in Miami, Los Angeles, London, um, Dubai. You know, it's just people everywhere all getting together, having conversations and chats. It's a bit like a conference. So it's like a conference where you've got people on the stage talking and you've got people in the audience watching, uh, kind of a bit like radio, a bit like a conference. Um, but it's amazing networking and the quality of the people on there at the moment is it's, it's a lot of very interesting people getting together and talking. Um, what's nice is that you don't, unlike video, you don't have to feel like you're very prepared. Like um, between us and all of our listeners, uh, the other day I was listening to um, Clubhouse while I was in the bath. I was having a, a rela- relax in the bath and, uh, and then they said, Daniel, what do you think on that? And I just sat very, I sat very, very still so I didn't make any water-related noises. And I, and I, gave, my, I gave my thoughts and my opinions and then uh, I put it back on mute and, and back, sat back in the bath. Um, so, so there's, you know, there's this ability to 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 kind of communicate with people without uh, without the pressure of video. Um, so that's um, that's good. The downside is, is it's not recorded, so everything is live. And if you're not creating live conversations, there is no evergreen content that you're producing. Um, so that's the downside. If I could only p- pick one platform, it would very much depend on the business. If it was a business to business thing, it would be LinkedIn. If it was a very visual product, it would be Instagram. Um, if it was a furniture business, it would be Instagram. Um, if it was a consulting company, it would be LinkedIn. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd, you know, basically pick. And if it was just, I don't know, it would be Facebook. Would you say the success of Clubhouse is, well, I guess with the current pandemic, everybody at home not being able to go, I think that's influenced its sudden success explosive of everybody jumping on it uh yeah and they've also used a lot of psychological tools to to get people hooked on it so the fact that you can only get on there through an invite and it's very public who invited you um and then they have a, a, a status hierarchy so you're in the audience and then there's another vip section of the audience called followed by the speakers which is the next level up I'm followed by one of the speakers right. <laughs> and then there's the stage. I'm a speaker. And then there's the moderators. So you've got about, you've got a right. hierarchy of about four levels and they're all nicely sectioned in the app. So you can kind of see where you sit on the status hierarchy. Um, and that is extremely mm. addictive to people. People feel very addicted. To that. Yeah. So- <clears throat> hierarchy. Yeah. We're, they we're um, I guess we're coming, uh, well, we're, we're coming to the end of uh, our time here. Um, Daniel, if you were to uh, give any advice to our listeners, um, and bearing in mind that a lot of our listeners are, I guess, Gen Zs, um, younger listeners, but a- anyone that's looking to maybe make a step or, or making some life decisions, um, do you have any parting wisdom that you can, um, you can leave with our listeners? It's the greatest time in history to be alive and an entrepreneur. It's it's despite the fact that you've got visibility into every, every single thing that's wrong with the world, it's actually the best time in the world. Um, it's just the fact that you can see lots of problems and you can see lots of things that are wrong, but in actual fact, there's never been more money. There's never been more opportunity. There's never been more technology. Um, there's never been more, um, uh, ability to put together teams. There's never been bigger problems that need solving. Um, so it's the greatest time in history to be alive, to keep that perspective in mind, to make sure that you realize that that's actually, um, uh, a, uh, you know, the, 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 the backdrop, the underlying theme is that actually this is the greatest time in history to be, be born and be alive. And, um, and just to, to also recognize that success happens through a series of doubles, right? So when, when we see successful people, what actually happens is there's a, a doubling effect that leads to success. So uh, what, it, what it really looks like is the person who has a million followers, the way they got to a million is they had 100, then 200, then 400, 800, 1,600, 32, 6,400, 12,000, 12, 24,000, 48,000, right? And they, they went through a series of doubles. 
And what happens with, with things that take, take off is that they just double very quickly. They typically, they, they go through a rapid doubling speed of things that, that, that take off. But for the vast majority of things, the vast, 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 vast majority of things, um, they take 10 doubles and each double takes a couple of years. So let's, you know, you do the maths on that and it just takes 20 years to get something to happen. Um, so if you think about starting a business, typically 100 grand becomes 200, 200, 400, 400, 800, 1.6, 3.2, 6.4, 12.8. So you're going through these doubles and it takes you the, until you get to the 10th double before the Ferraris show up. So, um, so essentially, you have to be willing to go through 10 doubles in order to do anything. And the vast majority of the time, um, that is, that is uh, just a 20-year journey. Um, and that's fine because it's a fun journey, right? You should, you should choose things where you actually feel excited about it being a 20 year journey. You, you just feel like this would be great. I wouldn't mind doing it for 20 years. It'd be great to get better and better at this for 20 years. Um, I'd love to see who, like judge the journey based on who am I going to meet along the way? Like, who, am I going to meet interesting people? Am I going to be around good people um, on this journey if it takes a, it takes a while? But also keep in mind that anything that's newsworthy is newsworthy because it's statistically irrelevant. So when you see a young person with a Ferrari, the reason that stands out is because it's statistically irrelevant. It normally, like it's 99.999% chance doesn't happen, and that's why it stands out. When you see a young, cool person hopping into a private jet, it's statistically irrelevant. That's why it's on your radar. Um, you know, that, that, so just keep that perspective that the things that stand out stand out because of statistical irrelevance. They're not, they're so unlikely to happen that that's why they're newsworthy. So, you know, just keep reminding yourself that if you're enjoying your journey and if you're moving forward and if you're uh, meeting good people, having deeper relationships and it's, you know, it's, it's all improving just focus on that and kind of the thing that young people have to be good at today is actually the skill called blocking stuff out. <laughs> just block it out and stay in your lane and focus um, and just surround yourself with good people. Uh, so yeah, that would be, that would be my little high horse rant. Brilliant. That was, that, that, was, for you, that, that was brilliant. Yep. Absolutely brilliant. And just one thing for our listeners, I know you put out a huge amount of content um, you've done, you've spoken live. So for those that maybe want to follow your journey or uh, maybe come see you live, hopefully when um, the live speaking events start up again, um, where can they, where can they follow you? Uh, well, a good, yeah, good places like Instagram. Um, so at Daniel Priestley, or you can grab one of my books. Entrepreneur revolution is really got a, a following people. Uh, everyone loves entrepreneur revolution it's got 10 challenges in there suitable for for young people um it's going to ask you to do some pretty wacky stuff as well um you know like carrying around thousand pounds and um <laughs> all sorts of stuff so uh so it's a, it's a fun book that sounds great awesome well, I think, Daniel, we're going to have to wrap up now. We have unfortunately run out of time. It has been brilliant to have you on today. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Rocket Pod. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Daniel as much as we did. Okay, now, join us next week. And you're not going to want to miss this as we're sitting down with the founder of Photobox himself, Graham Hobson. I definitely recommend hitting that subscribe button as this is a conversation you do not want to miss. Thank you, as always, to our sponsor, Flexi. Remember, they are the mecca for all your subscriptions. You can manage all of your subscriptions from a single dashboard. That's F-L-E-X-Y. Download it from the App Store today. Have an awesome week. We'll see you next time.